Good morning, everyone. It gives me a great pleasure to introduce our Dharma uncle, Edward Brown. Edward began sitting at Zen Center on Bush Street in May of 1965, a year after Soji Roshi, making him our Dar Dharma uncle. And as a good uncle and Dharma brother to Sojin, when Sojin went to Tassajara, Ed uh, monitored uh, BCC in residence for uh, the students that were uh, gathered there on Dwight Way. As a Tenzo, who supervised the preparation of meals at Tassajara, Edward subsequently published a number of books on bread baking, cooking, and helped to establish the Greens Restaurant at Fort Mason. Suzuki Roshi ordained him as a priest in, on September 11th, 1971, giving him the name Jusan Kaine, Longevity Mountain, Peaceful Sea. Sojin Roshi gave him Dharma entrustment in September 1996. He edited the book, Not Always So, a companion volume to Suzuki Roshi's lectures in Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. Edward is the subject of Doris Dory's documentary, How to Cook Your Life, available on Canopy streaming services through our public libraries. He left Zen Center in August 2018 and currently lives at The Land in Philo, California, where he leads meditation practice five days a week. Please give a warm welcome to Ed before he leaves us. <laughs> Okay. Um, thank you very much, Ross. That was a brilliant uh, introduction. Um, I'm uh, delighted to be here today. Um, as um, uh, Ross mentioned, I have um, not only a long history with the San Francisco Zen Center, but an equally long history off and on with the Berkeley Zen Center, uh, including uh, living on Dwight Way uh, for nine months in 1973 while Mel was at Tassajara, uh, at which time I met uh, some of you probably. <sighs> Though um, most of my uh, companions in those days are no longer at, uh, immediate in the immediate Berkeley Zen Center. Um, but Norman and Kathy and Blanche and Lou and uh, many uh, people who were male students um, practiced, I practiced with them in 1973. Maylie Scott, Rebecca Mayeno, Dolly Gatosi, um, many, many um, people there. Um, and um, it's, um, You know, in, in its way, um, as you know, those of you who practice there, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a good scale. It's not a huge uh, institution and it's not um, a little hole in the wall. Um, and uh, we have uh, Sojin Roshi to thank for that. And then um, Suzuki Roshi and um, the Zen lineage going back um, many centuries. So good morning. Thank you. Thank you uh, for inviting me, Ross. And um, before we get started, I'd like to uh, invite um, everyone uh, to uh, do uh, something that's a bit unusual. Um, but on the other hand, um, uh, not so unusual. Um, we each are sitting in our own uh, space, in our own place, with our own ground. Uh, and I'd like to invite you to connect your ground with the ground where I'm sitting here in Philo, California. And, um, you know, you might wonder, how do I do that? And you just go ahead and do it. 
um, connect your ground with my ground, ask your ground, would you connect with Edward's ground and let the ground take care of it. Uh, and then also you can ask the space that you're sitting in, the space which on one hand is your space and this space, which is the space we all share, you can ask your space to connect with the space where I am. So I say, you know, you can ask the ground to connect with the ground where I am. You can ask the space to connect with the space I am. On the other hand, you're simply acknowledging we share the same ground. We share the same space. And both the ground and the space, uh, each in their own way, are inconceivable. <clears throat> Thank you. I just um, got a copy of David Chadwick's new book, um, still fairly new, Zen is Right Now. Um, the first book of Suzuki Roshi stories, uh, which came out maybe 20 years ago was uh, first called To Shine a Light um, on Suzuki Roshi's teaching to shine a light in one corner of the world. Uh, and he changed the title of that book to Zen is Right Here. So now we have a companion volume, Zen is Right Now. Um, and as I do with books, I open it up randomly to have a quote for today. <laughs> And it was this, from a Shosan ceremony at Tassahara. Maybe it was one of you. Um, and the question is something like, um, if there's no past and no future, and we can't grasp the present, what's the point of asking a question? Uh, and uh, Roshi said, to speak something unknown to talk to Buddha. So um, here I am uh, saying something that hasn't been said before since this moment hasn't been here, happened before. Each moment is um, something unheard of, unknown, being revealed presently. Uh, and I consider Dharma talks not so much, you know, there's two kinds of talks um, or teachings. One is where you give out information uh, and then you can be tested to see if you have the information that was given out under your hat or under your belt. Um, you're keeping it around somewhere uh, for the examinations. Uh, and then there's the kind of talks which are, you know, uh, more what uh, Suzuki Roshi called, and uh, the Japanese Zen teachers had the sense of a speaking body to body or uh, heart to heart, rather than speaking from the usual uh, kind of talk which gives out information is speaking from one head to another head. Um, and you can um, open the book and read it, or you can have somebody uh, say it to you. So um, I'm in the business of speaking body to body, um, heart to heart. Um, and we'll see how it goes. Um, but that also means then that um, this is a conversation. Uh, and it, I'm not here to dispense uh, the correct understanding. 
uh, as though uh, you didn't already have it. We're starting with the basis of, uh, you know, the first line, I think it's the Jewel Mirror Samadhi. The mind of the great sage of India has been intimately communicated from east to west. Now you have it. Now you have it. Keep it well. Uh, and this is the basic Zen sensibility. Um, again, going back to our Japanese teachers, uh, Suzuki Roshi, I remember, would say, you know, you might think that you start with practice, sitting zazen, and then you study. Uh, and you can read uh, a sutras and um, Buddhist teaching. Uh, and then you get enlightened. But on the other hand, the reason you sit is because you are enlightened. You're already enlightened, so you sit. That's uh, wisdom, you know, functioning wisdom to uh, bring yourself to the cushion. Uh, so uh, this brings me to my um, topic for today. By the way, you can all hear me. You have enough technology to, okay. Uh, I'm talking, for me, I'm talking rather quietly. So <laughs> thanks to the technology here at work. <laughs> um, so today I thought I would, uh, you know, in my vernacular way, uh, you know, talk about the the one, um, you know, or the pivotal key instruction that Zen Master Dogen gives for meditation. Think not thinking. Think not thinking. There's a lot of other instructions, you know, set aside your judgments, your uh, your plans, your schemes, uh, your assessments. And then he has you cross your legs and put your hands and with your palms up and fingers on top of fingers and join your thumb tips and, and you lean from side to side. And he says, settle into steady, immobile, upright sitting. Think not thinking. Got it? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, for the most part, we'd much rather have a uh, you know, that's a little challenging. Uh, it's a bit of a koan. Uh, how do you think not thinking? Oh, let's think about that. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty funny when you think about it. <laughs> If you want to, if you start to wonder, what is that? What is that thing, that thinking? Uh, this is, um, so I'm going to give you some, uh, uh, start by giving you and talking about this, some of, some more of Suzuki Rishi's teachings. Forgive me, you know, the man has been dead for more than 50 years, and all I know to teach is the Zen I learned from him. So, um, plenty of people have come along since then, and the Dharma is ageless, and here I am. Anyway, um, Suzuki Rishi said, um, you know, at Tassahara one night, at the end of the evening, life is basically impossible. Good night. Um, and people were kind of like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and um, finally the next day, you know, there's Sazen, there's Kinian, there's Sazen, there's service, there's breakfast, there's study. Uh, sometime in, later in the morning, there was a lecture and somebody said after the lecture, any questions? And someone had a chance to say, Roshi, last night you said life is basically impossible. What are we going to do? And he said, you do it every day. Uh, so every day we do think not thinking. We don't figure out, we don't think about 
uh, well, shall I make the day now? Uh, is it time to take another breath? <laughs> you know, um, and what's impossible is to actually is to is to make plans to do something. And um, in this vein, you know, we have uh, Suzuki Roshi's teaching. Um, Uh, over and over again, you know, over many years, uh, sit without any uh, Zen is to sit without any idea of gain, without any idea of gain, without any picture, without any image, without some aim. Uh, that's as hard as think not thinking, isn't it? And people would say, but Roshi, why would we sit if we don't have anything, if we can't aim for some result? And he's, he would say, you know, well, there may be re results, but they're not necessarily what you're aiming for. They're unlikely to be what you're picturing and aiming, and you're trying to produce an experience that would validate you uh, and the you know the uh, and the importance of your being here and and your practice and validate you and uh, as though you had now you it was okay for you to be you is it okay yet the mind of the great sage of india has been intimately communicated you already have it and yet we're busy, we get busy like, I'm going to, I'm going to become a better me. I'll, I'll have more understanding, I'll have more wisdom, I'll get some concentration, I'll get some understanding, and I'll be able to do this impossible life better. <laughs> and it's worked out so well, hasn't it? <laughs> this impossible life. And it's 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 become all the more possible, right? <laughs> I don't know about you. Maybe so. You know, some people I think their life becomes more possible, but in my world, um, it's not always so. I sent a you know a, Ross gave a elaborate you know introduction, and um, and I sent him actually two introductions. The, the other one said had dropped out of college to go to the mountains and attain true realization. My life is about dropping out. It doesn't, it hasn't worked, you know? And then in about, oh, that was 1964. And then 1976, I was chairman of the board, president of Zen Center and, and head of practice for the city center, chairman of the board and president of a $4 million a year religious corporation. That's not what I set out to do. <laughs> so I dropped out and became a busboy at Greens. Uh, two or three years go by and I was the chairman, uh, I was the manager of Greens and the wine buyer. Uh, that's not what I uh, started spiritual practice for. You know, I went to, I dropped out. Well, I was asked to lead a practice period at Tessahara. So I've been assured that that will never happen again um, because only abbots or former abbots lead practice periods. And I've been assured that, Ed, you will never be an abbot. So, um, so much for having aims. And then go to the mountains and attain true realization. Does that look like dropping out? Was I busy thinking, not thinking? And actually, you know, if you think about it, excuse me, another another pun on thinking, but if you think about it, all you can do is think, not thinking. This is, Dogen doesn't give teaching that is not already reality. 
the nature of our life is think not thinking. There's no such thing as thinking. Uh, and thinking that your thought and our Western culture is besieged by this. You establish the thought and then you do uh, things according to that thought. So you should have good thoughts and good ethics and good standards and then, and then do what you're told and don't talk back. Now, is that, is that good? Is that reality or is that oppression? I'm sorry to bring this up. <laughs> Do what you're told and don't talk back. And, and, and we have some, and we here in Zen have better thoughts than those other people. So you should follow our thoughts because they're spiritual ones. Is that right? Oh, okay. Uh, so I had the good fortune of working on with Kaz Tanahashi from time to time on Dogen. And one of the, uh, chapters we worked on was only a Buddha and a Buddha. And here's uh, some of Dogen's other language for think not thinking. When you attain realization, he says, you do not think, aha, realization, just as I expected. Realization does not take place according to your expectation. And realization does not take place according to your conception. Realization takes place far beyond your conception, far beyond your thinking, far beyond your expectation. Reality takes place far beyond your thinking. What you want, what you can conceive, what you can imagine, what you can picture, and wouldn't that look good on my resume? Wouldn't that look good in my, uh, for my uh, pictured? self, the thoughts I have of myself. And those thoughts of self, of course, are just thoughts of self. That's not, you know, that, that's not reality. That's, well, it's, and Dogen's goes on, he says, um, so you should be cautious not to, that what you think one way or another is not a help for realization. You might think, well, I just tell myself to do this and not do that. And, and then, of course, at some point you have crises and you find yourself binge drinking or, you know, something. Or, or you just work all day. Okay. And Dogen says, um, it's not that past thoughts were not realization. Past thoughts already were realization. But you thought and you... You, you were looking elsewhere. You were looking elsewhere, so you thought, and you said, well, these thoughts can't be realization. No, you were busy. I'm going to get rid of the thoughts so I can have realization. Because think not thinking, and you shouldn't be thinking. <laughs> and if you get rid of your thoughts enough, you will have realization. And this brings us to the point that Dogen wrote the Fukan Zazenki, these instructions for meditation twice, first in 1227, and then again in 1245. And in 1245, he says, think not thinking. And the Sota school likes to say, oh, that's the instructions he wrote in 1227. You can read up about this in, you know, um, Carl Bielfeld's book, uh, Dogen's meditation manuals. Carl Bielfeld was a student of Suzuki Rishi's. Now he is or was the head of Buddhist studies at Stanford. Suzuki Rishi said, "Yes, you, 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 you study. That's who you are. You need to study. Please." I once asked Carl, "What is what is this think not thinking?" And Carl just like. I'm not touching that one. <laughs> uh, so, so much of our, uh, so we think that if I get rid of this thinking and I, I could, but 
so what I started to tell you was the first the first um, book on Zazanki, Doug, and said, settle into steady, immobile, upright sitting. If a thought comes, set it aside. If you do this long enough, your mind will become quiet and still. Isn't that a gaining idea? <laughs> and Dogen, another 20 years go by, and Dogen, bless his heart, came to think not thinking. That all of our life is not about thinking. It's not about think this and uh, act accordingly. Uh, do what's right, don't do what's wrong. It's not about that. It's uh, we have, uh, we're uh, human beings. We have the mind of the great sage of India. We have whole ranges of experiences and we have the capacity to dream up what to do with our one wild and precious life, as Mary Oliver calls it, to imagine, to dream up, to intuit, to to let the everything come through us and see what's revealed uh, and what uh, what uh, is, you know, Buddha, the everything, what are we being uh, called upon to do, which is beyond our thinking. It's beyond our following the instructions. I don't know about you, but you know, I practice seriously Zen. I call it institutional Zen, you know, for 20 years at Tassahara and the city center. And or, you know, I was committed. And then you get out and like, what do I do now? Well, if you're at Zen center, you follow the schedule. Who's making up the schedule? I had no practice in making up schedule. The day off, the days off were always the hardest. You had no idea what to do. What, well, what do I do? So we we come up with things to do, and we make schedules finally, and and it's good. It's good, you know, because if if we're not handling the affairs of today, you know, we can. We can be out on the street or homeless or what have you. You know, we uh, we find ways to take care of our life and the life of today. Um, but we have implicitly then we we uh, often have this idea like if I if I stop my thoughts, if I quieted my mind then something would be revealed. In other words, you know, if I behaved well enough, I would stay out of trouble uh, and I would be congratulated and approved of for my, my excellent behavior and performance. And yes, you learned your lessons well. Uh, I don't know, but you know, I'm more in the school of at some point, um, you know, I, I, I study a lot of different things. And one of the things I've studied is, um, you know, I, I fell in love with a book by um, a woman named Catherine McCann. It's called Unbecoming an Al Alchemist. Um, and she has a wonderful expression, which I think is, you know, her way of saying what Zen practice is. You know, because she says, uh, you can spend a lot of time trying to listen to all these instructions and get them right. And which ones will you follow? And, and then she says, take the driver's seat. Move to the driver's seat. You're the driver of your life. Sit in the driver's seat. And you have this uh, mind of the great sage of India. You have this uh, precious human life. 
Uh, and what will you do with your one wild and precious life? What will you do beyond just uh, fitting in, belonging, following the protocols? Is there more to life than protocols? Uh, and, you know, just one example of that is um, years ago, I read in the Sun magazine, you know, that lovely magazine out of North Carolina, there's a section readers write in. And um, there was a, one on dieting. And most of the uh, dieting letters were horror stories. Um, most of them were from women who had been shamed growing up and humiliated and berated and uh, for their weight. And did that help them? No. Um, they were taunted and teased and shamed and surely that will teach them a good lesson. Um, but people have found that if you're shamed, you then you head right for the ice cream or the peanut butter. Uh, you know, we have many ways to try to bring ourselves around to the uh, proper behaviors, the correct ones, according to the outside authorities. And how do you take your own authority? And a woman wrote in at that time and said that she had studied dieting and she'd, she wondered, did anybody lose weight and keep it off? And she found 12 or 15 people who had lost 25 pounds or more and kept it off for five years or longer. And she found out their secret. They had one thing in common. They'd each figured out for themselves how to lose weight. And she tried to write a book about this. She wrote a book about this. It was turned down by publisher after publisher, 11 New York publishers who said, no one wants to have to figure out things for themselves. Write a book telling people what to do. <laughs> and there's a great market out there. I'm, an, I'm a Sounds True author and I'm on their mailing list and almost every day there's one more teacher or one more program that's gonna tell you what to do. So all this to say is, you know, think not thinking is a beginner's mind. What will you do? How will you do this? Uh, and, um, you know, are, is, your, is your meditation okay? Is it, is there, are you, or do you need to improve? And, you know, that's another one of, of course, Suzuki Rishi's famous sayings, you're perfect just the way you are, but there's room for improvement. So um, we, um, it, it's, it's very curious, you know. Um, I think I'll, I'll finish up so we have time to talk. Um, uh, oh, so, You know, this is, this is not as simple, you know, our life um, and, you know, doing what you're told, following the instructions, seeing if you can accomplish the instructions and then, and then finding out the instructions. Uh, you know, it's like, uh, again, traditionally in Zen, we used to be told that You know, the instructions for the Zendo are not because they're the right thing to do. It's so we have a harmonious way to behave together while we practice sitting. Bowing, facing the cushion, bowing away from the cushion, turn, sit down, turn and face the wall. And when you get up, you know, stand in Shashu and uh, enter a certain way, leave a certain way. It's not because it's right or spiritual or it's so we have a way to do things together. 
And uh, Suzuki Roshi emphasized, uh, strictly speaking, there are no rules. And the best is that we um, give instruction one, one, one on one, one to one. And because we don't have time and because we're lazy, we give instructions to whole groups. Uh, so what we're learning finally is to trust. You know, trust your, your own uh, body mind, which is connected with everything, which is one, which is one with the mind of the great sage of India, one with the sun and the earth and the sky and the plants and the animals and uh, one with the great earth. Uh, with trees and stones and branches, fences. Uh, and when we sit, we're aiming to sit with everything. And there's, and then how would we know if we're sitting with everything or not? What would that look like? What would that look like? Was I sitting with everything today? How would I know? <laughs> but we keep talking with everything and listening to everything. And, and we experience various things and we, and we're shifting from, you know, how does that reflect on me to how do I connect or relate with that? Uh, so uh, we are finding our learning to trust our capacity to receive everything and respond to everything. And sometimes we respond to everything and, and people say, don't do that. We don't like that, not here. And other times people say, thank you. Um, but this is um, to trust uh, our own being, which is not just a human being, but, you know, you are a Buddha and you are an ordinary person. How can you be Buddha and an ordinary person? Don't worry about it. And you might think your practice is good. You might think your practice is bad. Strictly speaking, your practice is your practice. Your practice is your practice, period. Cannot be assessed. Thought about. Determine how far you've gotten. We don't do that so much in the Zen school. <laughs> Higher, lower. In, out. honored, uh, embarrassed. <laughs> so thank you so much. Oh, how about a poem? Uh, I like ending with poems. Um, uh, here's a Rumi poem. No, it's a, a William Stafford poem, a poem by William Stafford. And Stafford was uh, good friends with Robert Bly, who just died last year. And um, uh, quite a, um, you know, understated person. Uh, there's a lovely movie of him and Robert Bly made by a friend of mine, Hayden Reese. And Bly is so bombastic and, you know, how can I be close to you if I'm not sad? <laughs> and Stafford is kind of quiet and calm and taking all that in from Robert. Uh, anyway, here's Stafford's poem. It's time for all the heroes to go home, if they have any. 
Time for all the heroes to go home, if they have any. Time for all of us uh, common ones to locate ourselves by the real things we live by. Time for all of us common ones to locate ourselves by the real things we live by. Far to the north or indeed in any direction, strange creatures have always lurked. Elves, goblins, trolls, and spiders. We encounter them with dread and wonder. But once you've tasted the far stream, touched the gold, found some limit beyond the waterfall, a season changes and you return, changed, but still quiet, great. Suppose an insane wind holds all the hills, while strange beliefs whine in the traveler's ears. Suppose an insane wind holds all the hills, and strange beliefs whine in the traveler's ears. We ordinary people can cling to the earth and love where we are, sturdy or common things. Maybe we should change the lines. We ordinary people can sit zazen and enjoy our breath. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Uh, we have a few minutes at least uh, to visit and maybe a few more. I saw two announcements. One said we'd go until 11.15 and the other one said 11.30. So anyway, we have a few more minutes. If anyone has questions, comments, observations, reflections, uh, let's, let's, let's hear from them. Thank you very much, Edward, uh, for your wonderful talk. Uh, I will uh, field questions from everyone uh, while I'm at it. I'd like to ask you a question myself. Um, the uh, Let's see if I can do this. I can't spotlight myself. The question I have is that uh, the tension between sitting zazen and thinking non-thinking and the, thank you, and the um, Dhammapada's guidance to uh, beware of the unguarded mind uh, and that our thoughts lead us to X or Y. And without going into detail, I wonder if you could address the, I know one is sitting and one is not maybe, but how would you address that tension that I feel? <laughs> well, uh, it's all well and good um, and it's uh, accurate you know, that our uh, life follows our thinking. So then you might think, the thing to do is to regulate my thoughts and regulate the thoughts of others. <laughs> and that's what can't be done. <laughs> you know, um, our thoughts appear, and so uh, we're actually more more helpfully, you know, noticing uh, the, the thought and then what our response to the thought is and how we, you know, and that we actually have choice points where we buy into that thought, you know, because we can have the thought, I'm going to get angry. This calls for, this calls for anger. And we have that thought whether we notice it or not. But it, in order to get angry, you have to have the thought to get angry. Mm. Often we don't notice it, but we have a thought, I'm going to get angry. And then the next moment we go like, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> or the next moment we go like, as we say about, I'm sorry to keep saying Suzuki Roshi, but you know, I can just talk for myself too. But you know, we should have a good relationship with monkey mind. So, uh, and it's not that we get rid of monkey mind, which could monkey mind could be seen as the mind of thinking. Mm. And uh, so to have a good relationship, sometimes monkey says, hey, look the, over there, there's some food. And then we say, oh, okay, monkey, let's, let's get something to eat. And other times the monkey might say, let's get angry. And it's like, monkey, it, it hasn't really helped in the past. Let's, let's not go there. <laughs> <laughs> So, so, 
we can't uh, can't control our thinking. What we can observe um, and notice, and that's where, in a certain sense, uh, already thinking is realization. When we're but we're having a we're in conversation or relationship with thinking, rather than trying to oppress our own thinking and tell our thinking what to think, what not to think. And and then who's doing that? <laughs> you know, that's what in Zen about putting another head putting a head over your head, which was Nyogen Senzaki's famous last words to his students. Uh, don't put another head over your head. Keep your feet warm and your head cool. Uh, but it's a lovely question. It's a lovely thing to think about. And uh, that's my response of how think not thinking means. Uh, or, you know, uh, another one is uh, in the Platform Sutra, at least one of the translations of the Sixth, An Sixth Patriarch Ancestor, um, you know, there's a pronoun, uh, Coleman Barks is a pronoun in Farsi for he, she, it, we, they, and God. I want that one. But, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, anyway, um, I lost track of where I was going and too many things occurred to me. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll bring in the next person. Go ahead, Kate, uh, with your question. Good afternoon, Kate. Good evening, almost here in France. Good evening. Okay. <laughs> um, I really, I heard something like a theme that jumped out at me today and I found quite exciting in a way. It was almost that, not that there aren't any rules, but rather that there are so many live interpretations of any set of the rules. Yes, within practice, but, you know, I've expanded that out and to say kind of all of life. Um, and particularly where you said, like, even Master Dogen is kind of rewriting his, you know, things ah. like a, a work in progress. I've never, <laughs> that made him feel like a real kind of live and dynamic person. So thank you for that. <laughs> and especially when you talked about embarrassment, you know, what one person, what, what other people might think of our practice of our lives. And it had me reflect right in that moment, wow, I have spent, wasted a lot of energy trying to avoid embarrassment at the you know perceived or worried idea about what others might think about my practice and my life and um yeah i felt like i saw that in a in a fresh way today from listening and you know maybe hopefully please that's a habit that i could drop that i might be able to drop given that the rules are so open to interpretation at any moment you're in the so, driver's yeah. seat <laughs> no one will give you your own authority no one gives you permission to be your own authority you're going to have to take you're going to have to assume your own authority and give yourself permission so, uh, you know and then you're like oh my god it's up to me to be me and i can't just do it and follow the instructions here uh-oh we're in trouble <laughs> 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 thank you <laughs> so this is why you know uh, Ru, uh, Zen master uh, Dogen's teacher Ru Jing wrote a poem you know um, the great road uh, has no gate it begins in your own mind the sky has no marked trails yet it finds its way to your nostrils and becomes your breath somehow we meet like tricksters or bandits of the dharma where, you know, if you're going to be on your own authority, you could be in trouble. Uh, you know, as far as who's going to come down on me for this? And, um, and somehow, and, you know, if you're, you know, Gandhi said, you suffer your truth. If you're willing to suffer your truth, then, okay, that's good, you know. But it's if you if you're not willing to separate, how true is it? <laughs> anyway, excuse me. Thank you so much for coming on, and, um, and and wonderful to hear this opening in a new a new world. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Kate. Uh, now we'll have a question from Ross. Please go ahead, Ross. Just a comment. Hey, Ed. 
Um, thank you for offering the alternative uh, introduction. I had to pick and choose, and uh, that really filled out your picture of who, who you are. I don't have a question so much as a comment. At the beginning of your talk, uh, you invited us to um, feel the ground and connect to you up in, uh, in Philo. And it reminded me uh, last week I was in a conversation with a friend and um, there was a disconnect between she and myself. I could feel the pain and anguish and such in me, certainly, and, I, and she was demonstrating uh, that as well. And for the breathing practice that I was doing, I felt still felt connected to her. But in your request this morning to reach out and connect to the land is something that I could have uh, done that day in some way to reach out to her to connect uh, and help with that relationship. In other words, I felt fine connected in the dissonance, breathing and being still, but I'm not sure if I uh, was a, if she felt the same way. And yeah. I'm, in the future, I'm going to try to do that practice that you suggested. <laughs> and I'll let you know how it goes. Yeah, and you can always dream up other ones that are just as suitable. Okay. Thank you, friend. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you, Russ. Thank you, Russ. Actually, we have a question in our chat, Ed, Edward, which says, uh, how can we offer criticism without also offering shame? Uh, a wonderful question. Um, and uh, some of us, of course, are feel shamed rather easily. Uh, so, so no matter how skillful the other person is, uh, when we hear uh, some kind of criticism or adjustment, possible way to adjust one's body, speech, or mind according to the outside, uh, what's outside there. Um, uh, you know, no matter how skillful it is, uh, some of us can still feel uh, go right into shame. Um, but the uh, the classic uh, sensibility is to and this comes up with child rearing too, which is um, which most of us grew up in an era when uh, people were into shaming. Uh, so uh, we say, um, don't do that and shame on you. Uh, we literally say shame on you as a method to uh, change behavior. Uh, and the classic um, understanding uh, first of all, Zen Master Dogen says simply um, express yourself fully without trying to defeat the other person. So um, more technically then that's to say you you honor the person. You're you are a beautiful soul. You have a you have you're such a good hearted person. And I I, I want you to know that that behavior didn't work uh, so well for me. So. Um, and I over and over again forget this. I don't know what to say. I get caught up in conversations. So it's an ongoing study. How do we honor someone being a good-hearted human being? Uh, and, um, and, and the, this particular behavior. So it's making that distinction between you're perfect the way you are and there's some things you could work on there's some things you do. And of course, the Western world is confused. You know, we've all grown up with this confusion of, no, 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 my behavior is about me. <laughs> and then if the behavior is about me, then we can be shamed no matter how skillful someone is. Because we right away understand that behavior refers to me. It's not just my behavior. Oh, no. And then if we're and then the, pro the problem with shame is, uh, shame is you believe that there's something implicitly inherently wrong with you. In other words, you believe you do not have the mind of the great sage of India, and you need to fix your behavior uh, more and more perfectly in order to finally become an okay human being. And it can't be done. It can't, you can't, you can never perform well enough to uh, you can never do your behavior well enough to 
improve your being because behavior is not that's that's something that's behavior and then there's your being and ultimately you know we're aiming to have or hoping or not even aiming but if we you know, win the enlightenment lottery um we realize that the uh basic nature of reality there's no shame there's no shame to self dogen calls it hitting the mark he said when you hit the mark um you realize hitting the mark is to realize you are Buddha on the spot without changing anything about your body or your mind. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you. Wonderful question. Very important to think about that and to understand. That. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, questioner. We have a question from Hosan, and we're going to take these three questions and uh, uh, finish uh, as soon as we can. So, Hosan, please go ahead. Good morning, Edward. Good morning, Hosan. Really enjoying it. Um, so a conundrum. Uh, Hosan, could you adjust your volume, perhaps? Upward. Hang on. What do I do? Is this any better? No. Yes. No. Uh, let's see. How about this? Better. Still no. One minute more. I'm really sorry. Uh, no words. This. Yes. No. No. I'll, I'll pass then. I'll just pass. Then. Okay, come back to. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, we're going to call on um, Raghav. Please, Raghav, go right ahead. Good morning, Raghav. Good morning. Great. Um, nice to hear you talk. Um, as you were talking, you know, something that came to my mind was uh, what I remember of Suzuki Roshi's word regarding the precepts. It's not something that comes from outside, but is your inmost request. Um, and I've thought about it as, why is it the inmost request? And um, that's been the, the key thing for me in terms of like, um, I have, <laughs> I have uh, a, a thinking around this. Um, maybe I'll put it out and then we'll see where it goes. But I feel it's not individual in the sense it's not about me. It's more about humanity itself. You know, we say that Buddha's in the 10 directions three times, which I understand as past, present, and future, like that our humanity, the cycle of humanity keeps going round and round and round. And we are born each moment and we die in the sense humans are dying and being born every moment. And is that, is that what that means? Which is the cycle keeps going and we are born the next moment as another baby. And maybe we want to inherit a better world um, in some way, maybe a little bit better. Humanity will always be making mistakes but maybe this line of teaching from the great sage of India, from the great sage of India, maybe continues to show that there is another way. Uh, it's a very important question. Uh, uh, and um, I'm reminded of many things as you talk. Um, most recently, I, I did a talk on um, or, or I wrote a, a, a little uh, piece on uh, Suzuki Roshi's expression that um, uh, you know when you practice uh, Buddhism, this was at Tassahara, you know, and he said when you when you practice Buddhism, you should be connecting with your inner life, and if you're not connecting with your inner life, find something that connects you with your inner life. So that's something that comes from inside. What's your, you know, your inner life? And I asked him. I said, I don't know if that's happening or not. What do I do? And he said, Keep sitting. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we um, more and more connect with. Ideally, hopefully, we connect with our inner life. And um, and as I was saying at the end of my talk, we learn to trust our inner life. 
um, you know, and when the the Tibetans often have uh, taught, and they, I hear it less now, but you know, treat everybody as your mother because she nourished you and fed you and clothed you and wiped you and and Western Westerners they had no idea that and Westerners would say, "Are you kidding, my mom?" <laughs> <laughs> But that spirit, that feeling, you know, you, and then somebody would say, well, everybody could have been your mother. I mean, you say, well, you treat everybody as your mother because they could have been your mother in, in a past life. Why don't you treat everybody as your murderer? Because they could have been your murderer in a past life. And they said, no, when it's, you're treating them as the mother, that's she herself. That's, that's from her heart. The murder is you know, afflicted and under the captivated by something that is not, you know, not their from their own being, so to speak, not their inmost uh, being. Mm. So yeah, we keep studying and, uh, and that's where the, the precepts come in. And as I was saying, you know, when you when we do something, you know, personally, it doesn't help me much when people say you're breaking your precepts. Like, excuse me. Um, but you know, sometimes, but if they say, you know, you you did this or this, oh, okay, yeah, I see, yeah, that was not uh, an expression of my inner inmost nature. That was not in accord with my good heart. Mm -hmm. so I, I understood. I'll see what I can do. No guarantees. But thank you so much for your question. Thank you. Thank you, Raghav. We'll go ahead with Lori uh, for our last question. Okay, Laurie, good, good morning. Hi, Hi Edward. What a great painting yes. behind you, or whatever that is. It's a little piece of cloth behind me. Oh, God. <laughs> just a feeling of fabric. Yeah. Yeah. I partly kind of just wanted to say, flow some energy there, say hi. And, and what I was thinking during your talk was sort of, so that there's thinking. Think not thinking, and then there's feelings. Feelings are a lot of what's happening, I've noticed. <laughs> Possibly even as much or more than thinking. I mean, is there any kind of feel not feeling? I, that doesn't quite hit the mark for me, but I wondered if you just wanted to say a few words about feelings. Well, um, yeah, thank you so much. Um, I have... Um, you know, we're different kinds of people. So um, my kind of person, one uh, aspect of that is, you know, much as I tried to get rid of feelings that were afflictive and painful, they don't go anywhere. Um, and, um, and then you get into the business of who's telling who to be what? Yes. Why would you do that to yourself? Um, anyway, um, uh, in a, again, in the Western world, and we live in this culture where we've been over and over again, don't be scared, don't be sad, uh, you know, don't be this, don't be that. And uh, so it's very hard for us to, to, have, uh, to have our feelings. And I'm, I, it, at some point, began more and more consciously, rather than trying to get rid of the feelings, to feel what you feel, to know what you feel when you feel it and be able to articulate it in such a way that others don't go running out of the room or, you know, uh, gingerly back away, keeping their eye on you. <laughs> so, um, and you can do that with anger and fear and, you know, and not attacking somebody or not emoting your feelings, but expressing them by, you know, having them and owning them. Uh, and that seems uh, in our world so rare to meet people who are in that same business as me in that sense. So, uh, and this is related to, um, uh, you know, there's now much, a lot of literature, Carla McLaren and uh, emotional and, and, you know, Dan Goldman, emotional intelligence, Carla McLaren, the you know, chemistry of emotion or whatever it was. And, there's books by a woman named Linda Kohenoff who, and many people now say emotion is, is information. Uh, and 
um, that we are informed by feeling. And it's not something, And but in the West, we have this idea like, no, nope, we want thought to be in charge, you know, here, thought is in charge and thought will, and it's, it's, it's a misnomer because thought has ne never been in charge and we don't do what our thought tells us to do. After we do something, there's a spin doctor that says, that was good, that was bad. What were you thinking? And why did you do that? And uh, congratulations, and that was not bad. And so our thinking kind of takes over after we've already done something. And our thinking, we can't, we can't do anything. Just like realization is not like you expected. Even if you think so, that's not, that's not true. And it doesn't take place according to your conception. And our life isn't. And uh, so we, uh, the feelings, you know, many people have talked about this and there's now whole schools of, you know, how intelligent it is and feelings are more associated in that sense with your gut brain than your head brain. And you, um, and of course, you want them to be on the same page, but you can make, and you can make mistakes either way, following your head and doing what you should and getting yourself in all kinds of trouble because of that, or, you know, because you should uh, do what the man says. <laughs> no, uh, and you shouldn't, uh, you know, get angry. Uh, so, uh, oh, you should let yourself be abused if you want to be loved uh, and so on. It's very confusing, you know, to follow your head. And then there's uh, following your feelings and then you, you own your feelings and, you know, stop that. And then you say, stop that and when, you know, when you are unhappy with something. Or you say, please, don't, don't do that. You know, you're... So it's a whole world of, that invites us to um, stand up for ourselves, stand our ground, and uh, speak our truth. Uh, and that, a lot of that comes from uh, much of that comes from our emotional intelligence and our gut brain, or our second chakra, our hara. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much. So before we uh, stop, uh, please invite your ground back from here to the ground where you are and have it connect to the ground around you. And have it invite your space back. If you invited your space here, invite your space back where you are and connect to the space around you and your space and ground uh, are with you all the time. The more you're aware of that, practicing that, then the more uh, uh, reality to, there is to that. So thank you so much. 